So welcome everybody. What a what a fun thing to get together every third Tuesday of the of the month for a nice presentation. Uh, and tonight we got a great one. We'll be favored shortly to hear from our own Brad Westwood, who even deigned to wear a tie. I know. It's <laughs> Um, who's going to be talking about Salt Lake West Side stories. And this has nothing to do with sharks and jets though, right, Brad? Nope. Not, no, but uh, anyone Bird. who'll come to the website because of that, I'm, I'm, you're not hurting my feelings. <laughs> the, um, these are about, it's about the history of the Pioneer Park neighborhood of Salt Lake City and its history, which is gonna be really interesting. We always have a special presentation in December and it's it's uh, it's really fun to have Brad be the one uh, this year to do this and we're he's very fitting to fill this important uh, role uh, and I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> let's go around and see who's visiting just for fun. It's always interesting to see who shows up. Are there any visitors this evening? Ken, could we get him to unshare his screen so we can see the gallery and tell his yeah, you can cover it up. Can you do that, Brad? Can you? Yes. How are you, Susan? Speaking um, of BYU professors. Yes, I was just thinking that uh, I was a high school student at Stanford when BYU and Stanford had their falling out about that. Oh. So. Now, I'm not sure if I did what you asked. Let's see, should I stop sharing? Stop. How's that? There you go. Yeah, now we there you go. Thank you. Now, you'll need to, you'll need to, come back on when you're ready, but this way everybody can see each other for the moment. Um, any any visitors? I'm a visitor. Please, introduce I'm Frank yourself. Fester. Frank Fester from um, Weller Bookworks, also from University of Utah Marriott Library Preservation Department. Uh, Craig hey. Smith <laughs> invited me. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being. Thanks, Craig, for inviting him, and thanks for being here. Welcome, welcome. Anybody else? Yeah, hi, I'm Todd Berlin. I'm Steve Berlin's son, and I'm participating from Chicago, Illinois tonight. Good well, evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome, Todd. Thank you for joining us. Thank Good you, to Steve, be here. Thank you for having me. Who else? I have a guest here with me tonight. It's my uh, son, Ian Wright, and he just uh, became the Cultural Site Stewardship Coordinator the Utah State uh, Historic Preservation Office, and he's uh, been a guest before at Westerners. Hey, congratulations, Ian, and thanks, Doug, for bringing him, and thanks for coming, Ian. I have a guest. Please. Uh, so Tyler Bond is with us. He's been with us about, I think this is probably his fourth or fifth uh, Zoom meeting, but he's uh, very interested in Utah history, a good friend of mine. I, I invited him to come join us tonight. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, uh, I also have a guest with me, my wife sitting right next to me. So <laughs> great. Thanks, Alan. Hello, Welcome Barbara. Home. Hi there. How are you? Nice, nice to have you here with us. Thank you. We have um, 52 logins. That's really good. That's great. And this, this should be, this should be really fun. Um, couple of things on, on the, on the note of, uh, people who are interested in, in Western history and Utah Westerners. For the first time in a long time, we have several openings in our group, uh, mostly because of, sadly, because we have had members of our group pass away in the last few months. Uh, we've got several. Um, uh, Steve Berlin included this month on the newsletter, the criteria for uh, new members. And if any of you have ideas please fill it talk to talk to a person fill out an application and we will act on it quickly and we do you know we're down three or four so openings which we don't often have uh, in our wonderful group the um, also be sure to be be sure to look at the newsletter there's always interesting stuff in it this month we've got Kurt bench is review of a book on the uh, Edward Eberstadt and Sons, which was a famous rare Western Americana bookstore. Um, we've got uh, an announcement from Roy Webb regarding the uh, Candace Cravens, a new director of the John Wesley Powell Museum of Riz River History in Green River. 
Utah. We've got a column from Wilt Bagley on the Christmas John Wesley Powell spent among the Mormons. Um, we have excerpts from historical articles of ce uh, articles celebrating Christmas by different peoples and diverse groups in Utah. And we've got a lot more. So, you know, it's, uh, it would be well worth your time to spend a little bit of a uh, few moments to look through that. Timely reminder, we have dues, dues due uh, next month. Um, somehow we are managing to make it through uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, we've even had a few speakers we wouldn't otherwise be able to get because we can stream uh, everyone. And so I appreciate uh, all of you participating. I also appreciate all your generosity in contributing money to help us uh, contribute to others and to make sure that we're running uh, well. So any other announcements that we should hear about? If not, I understand Greg Thompson, wherever you are, is going to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Brad Westwood, and we'll all, uh, Brad, turn back on your share screen so we can see your PowerPoint. And uh, thank you very much for attending tonight. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge Ken and his leadership over the past year, year plus, uh, in developing the series as they are presented, holding us together and guiding us down the virtual path of whatever, history, I guess. And also the, the efforts of his technical team, Craig and Steve, and our board members. It's been a hardworking group and um, uh, much appreciate the, the contributions each of you have made. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce my longtime friend, associate, colleague, rogue historian fellow uh, to you this evening. Most of you, I think, know this gentleman uh, quite well. For those that you don't, let me give you just a little bit of background about Brad Westwood. He gave you a few hints to his uh, early uh, times and careers and hanging out in Provo. Uh, he did graduate from BYU in 1985. He followed that up with a master's of science degree in historic preservation at the University of Pennsylvania in 1994, um, and uh, it's long in there where I suspect, um, I don't know when I actually first met Brad, uh, but it seems like I've known him for most of my life, and, uh, but perhaps in that period, where he came to work uh, with us uh, as a colleague in special collections at the J. Willard Marriott Library University of Utah with his wonderful background uh, sharpened by his academic days at Penn uh, in uh, historic uh, archaeology, uh, excuse me, uh, architectural uh, um, topics. And uh, he, he saved our hides, quite frankly. Uh, he came to work under Nancy Young to help us manage our architectural archives, which was growing, and uh, to give us uh, uh, exquisite training and, and really work with us. And um, I, I kind of date my, uh, certainly my professional career working with uh, Brad from that time on. He went on to um, be a member of the, J, the Harold B. Lee Library, uh, staff, faculty, and um, uh, directed special collections there during his tenure of 1995 to 2009. He left to uh, come upstream up north into God's country where he took a position as um, the uh, manager of acquisitions for the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints History uh, Department. And um, he did that uh, from 2009 to 2013. 
when a fellow Westerner and then chair of the State History Board, Mike Homer, uh, wrangled him into uh, applying for the position of Director of State History. It's an interesting story. Uh, I was on the board and Mike uh, got a hold of me and said, we got to get Brad in State History. State history needs his talent, his creativeness. We were sitting together, Brad and I, at the, uh, I believe it was probably the, the 2013 California Antiquarian Book Fair being held in San Francisco in the old uh, commercial district south of uh, Market Street and Mission. And uh, he and I sat on a bench in the middle of this uh, exquisite book fair with thousands of wonderful books, talking about the ups and downs, the pluses and the, and the negatives of coming to work for state history. Really what we were doing, we're, we were putting the, 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 uh, uh, the hold on him uh, and not letting him get away. He did indeed become director of state history, held that position from 2013 to 2018, when he promoted, uh, was promoted into his current role, which is that of a senior public historian for the Utah State Department of Heritage and Art. It is a very appropriate position for Brad. Brad is one of those individuals who uh, has enormous energy and is very creative. And beyond that, he has the ability to see the, the big picture in a major way. And at every one of those positions I've talked about, he has uh, given of his talents in that way to those positions, departments, and, and uh, whatnot, leaving them with in a much better state than they were when he came. Brad is truly a creative, wonderful historian who knows how to take history and make it into um, a real uh, product that adds to uh, the society's well-being and to communities and, and enhances those communities. He continues to do that today. And um, you will see and hear some of his incredible talents uh, as he speaks to us today, tonight, on Salt Lake West Side Stories. It's with great pleasure I welcome my colleague, friend, and uh, uh, absolutely amazing person, Brad Westwood, to the podium for the Utah Westerners. Thank, thank you, Greg. Um, I've appreciated you as a mentor and a dear friend, so thank you for introducing me. Um, I, I look forward each year to our December meeting. The Alda Club is decorated for the season. There's a great deal of catching up, lots of warm expressions of fondness for one another. In that spirit, I want to express to all of you my appreciation to you and this organization. I sorely miss the Alta Club particularly during this time of year. To the left is a Christmas card sent out by the Salt Lake City architectural firm of Young and Hansen in 1927. The firm designed the Federal Reserve Bank building, which prior to 1988 stood south across the street from the Alda Club. They also designed the LDS Church's Washington Chapel in Washington, DC, and I, always loved the drawings of Ram Hansen, and so I wanted to slip this in as a way of saying Merry Christmas and happy, uh, uh, wonderful holidays to all of you. I invite all of you this coming Friday when it's launched to tune in to the next podcast of Speak Your Peace, which is my podcast about Utah's history. In this show, I interview Utah Westerners current president, Ken Cannon, regarding the LDS Church's first presidency member, George Q. Cannon, and his three oldest sons, John Q. Cannon, 
Abraham Cannon and the latter one, the two, one of the two first senators from the new state of Utah. It, it's an informal, insightful exchange. And again, this podcast will be launched Friday, and I wish and hope you'll join us then. The Salt Lake, the Salt Lake West Side Stories blog series has a sweep from the ancient history to the last decade. So there's much to take in in these rather capsulated 30 plus posts. It also is very geographical. It's about a very specific area of Salt Lake City. One could even call this local history. So tonight I want to offer some arguments, some highlights, some musings, something of a 30,000 foot level look at this very unique neighborhood. I also welcome your questions and comments in the Q&A session afterwards. Salt Lake West Side Stories involves health issues, cultural issues, politics, industry, housing, and over a dozen overlapping micro communities that were in the West, in the old West Side, many with their own unique material culture, languages, beliefs, and food ways. These were small, very culturally rich neighborhoods that either were adjacent to or mixed with others. Included were African Americans, Italians, Greeks, Syrian, Japanese, and more regarding these combined micro communities, I've come to realize that these communities were seen by the eyes of the beholder, uh, with the particular community spots often scattered in many West Side streets. When I interviewed people, I realized people were talking about the very same streets, but their sites were located elsewhere. Now, in my daydreaming working on this project, uh, I wish I could do some time travel, especially in meeting places like taverns, coffee shops, oh. restaurants. The left photo is of Emmanuel uh, Katsanavas, who is a prominently standing as the proprietor, third from the left, with his dog at his feet, and beside the dog is a water bowl. There are staged musicians in the background. This photo is located in Greek town in the open park coffee house. I would have loved to hear the conversations, hear the music, smell the Greek or Turkish coffee, and hear the opening and folding of newspapers, both local and foreign. Regarding newspapers, Salt Lake City had dozens of immigrant minority community newspapers that were produced in the West Side. Or in my dreaming, I would like to have watched Jack Dempsey, who reigned as the heavyweight champion of the world from 1919 to 1926. Living in the 19 teens in Salt Lake in Utah, he was setting up barroom fights for money to hone his boxing skills in the taverns of West Side Salt Lake. This is the Pioneer, or was the Pioneer Coalition History Committee, which was the start of this project. Pioneer Park Coalition staffer Vikram Ravi, who's third from the left, who, by the way, his parents came to the U.S from India before he was born, contacted the Department of Heritage and Arts and invited the department to explore the history of the Pioneer Park and its neighborhood. The Pioneer Park Coalition wanted to, whatever the future the park held, they wanted the history of the park and the neighborhood somehow integrated into the design, the future design for the park. Now the Pioneer Park Coalition members frequently said to me in my interactions, we have a wonderful history about the Pioneer Park and the Rio Grande neighborhood. And they said that frequently. However, finally, confidentially, a couple of their leaders said, we're not entirely sure just what our history is. The end result of that confession by the Pioneer Park Coalition was the Salt Lake City West Side Stories, this blog series that was free and accessible to all. These are the individuals who informed us about over two dozen ethnic, migrant, and immigrant communities, churches, organizations, and interested parties. Our meetings were filled with mutual appreciation, exploration, and respect for one another's stories. A very clear early goal for Salt Lake City West Side Stories was to incite empathy. And thus it was a public history, an open project that we wanted as many people to see and read. And some of these names you may recognize. 
was a, a really wonderful group of uh, citizens who loved the history of the west side of Salt Lake. What do I do as a public historian? Public historians use their training to meet the needs of a community or public, whether that community is defined as a city, a neighborhood, a business, or in my case, a state. It combines the academic and institutional, such as museums and libraries and historical societies, with public facing engagement. My primary gig, as I state so often, is to make peer reviewed, evidentiary based history known to the widest audience, those Utahns who really should know better the history of Utah. What were the sources consulted? They were available, all available sources that were published or digital collections, reports, newspapers, theses, and dissertations. I basically mined a rich collection of materials available, but not readily available. One of the purposes of the Salt Lake West Side Story is to encourage readers to consult these publicly accessible sources. And so at the end or the bottom of each post, you will see a number of, of recommended readings. And they're also directed readings that can get you to a fuller list, list of sources. Those who I've spoke to about this series tell me that going down the rabbit hole is more enjoyable in some cases than reading the posts, which doesn't hurt my feelings whatsoever. What were the other purposes in creating Salt Lake City West Side Stories? It was to engage people to take related outings and field trips to study directed readings and to improve their all around historical literacy about the city. Just like the leaders of the Pioneer Park Coalition eventually confessing to me they really didn't know much about the history of the area, there are many Salt Lakers who do not know the basic history of their city besides those grand stories that we often hear on an annual basis. Next, how did the Utah Westerners play a role in this project? This is a unique organization representing, as past president Steve Gallinson often described it, an organization rich with both researchers and writers of history, but equally as important, readers and trackers of Utah's history. It is also, in my estimation, a key organization in Utah, which strives to tell an all-inclusive majority-minority history, including broader regional stories. As Michael Homer, who Greg mentioned, often stated to me when he was the state history board chairman and long time, he is also a long time Utah Westerner. He described the Utah Westerners as the big tent offering an all-inclusive history of Utah. Now there were many sources that I turned to and as I gathered these sources, I realized there were an abundance of Utah Westerners uh, or people who presented to the Utah Westerners. Juanita Brooks, Dale Morgan, Helen Papa Nicholas, Phil Notoriani, Don, Don Gale, Will Bagley, Ringham Madsen, Walter Jones, Marty Allen Evans, Gibb Smith, and a dozen other Utah Westerner writers. Much of the community archives used in making this series came from Linda Thatcher State History Collection. More than anyone else, Greg Thompson's magnificent 40 years effort at documenting and collecting all these communities that we studied. The Utah Westerners influence permeates this blog series. Now, it's a geographical based history. <clears throat> the borders of West Side stories is old Salt Lake West Side. It's North Temple to Six South. Uh, and then from West Temple to the railroad corridors, which in the early 1960s was joined by I-15. Now this photo was taken in 1953, and if you look carefully, it's before the freeways were built. What's in a name? Names and names and more names. Poor Town, Little Italy, Greek Town, Little Syria, Japan Town, Little Tokyo. Older names included the Old West Side. More recently, city developers and private developers have given also new names. Depot District, Hardware District, Station Center, and of course the most prominent is the Rio Grande District. The neighborhood has had many identities, most of them given by, by the majority population, and they were not intended to ex express endearment. I will, and the blog series uses both West Side and Pioneer Park neighborhood interchangeably. 
Until the third quarter of the 20th century, Salt Lake City's West Side neighborhood served as a base camp or a starting point for nearly every immigrant group, especially those non-LDS or people of color who settled in the valley in Utah and across the Intermountain West. What I realized in taking this geographical based history is so much of these ethnic groups, these communities had their beginnings and in some cases remained in the west side of Salt Lake City. Beginning in 1847, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints laid claim to the whole region, but they first camped and settled in the city's west side. Other immigrant pioneers followed, most of them labor-seeking immigrants, including Jews from Germany, West Europe, and Russia, Chinese, Chinese African, Italian, Greeks, Syrian, Mexican, Japanese, and Latino, or Latinx. During the 1970s and 1980s, the Pioneer Park neighborhood was also the physical and political gathering place of Salt Lake City's LGBTQ communities. After 1870, with the entrance of the railroad, to 1890, with the explosion of the streetcar subdivisions, this area was the area of industry, railroads, it was the one place where most non-Mormon labor or economic immigrants lived. Eventually, this became somewhat codified as the location of people of color. By the 1890s, from the wellspring of Salt Lake City's west side, this diverse and growing group of communities began to have tremendous influence. In a little while, I'll talk about just how influential these woe-begotten groups were in Utah. I struggled with all of the different subjects that I could talk about. And I thought, I'll just give you some historical observations and arguments at 30,000 feet, that proverbial commercial jet cruising altitude. And to benefit this effort, I've given you this bird's eye view of Salt Lake City. And if you note all the smokestacks, all the, uh, the smoke coming out, it's on the west side. Here are my observations in this year-long effort to understand this neighborhood. Salt Lake Valley was not tabula rasa or a blank slate, nor were the Native Americans simply part of the natural history of the valley. Now this is an old way of thinking and it continues with us in Salt Lake City with the Natural History Museum, mu museum being the key place for telling the story of Utah's pre-existing people who occupied this area. Now, Salt Lake City was and is a place of constant use and had been used by Utes, Shoshone, as well as Goshute and Paiute as a crossroads and as a homeland. It was only a promised valley for one very large incoming group, but it was a home, an active society made up of thousands of prior inhabitants. Now, I knew this story. I had understood the history, at least in a minimal sense, about our Native American uh, uh, community members, but it struck me just how much an active life there was in this area. Nomadic, yes, but the valley was thoroughly lived in. Beyond the Native Americans who were pushed out by incoming settlers, other people preceded them, and this is underscored by the Salt Lake City's first cemetery. How many of you have seen Salt Lake City's first cemetery, and where might that be? Any ideas? Just this is, Park. yeah, just near Pioneer Park. <clears throat> With this, it, it was a raised area one block east of Pioneer Fort. Here, the Mormon pioneers buried 33 individuals in three rows during the settlement's earliest years. Now, this is a map of the BYU Public Archaeology Office map of the first Euro American settler burial ground. But what's more important is that it includes the burial of many ancestral Pueblo people, literally beneath the pioneer graves. These ancient burial grounds date from 700 to 1200 years. The cemetery became a resting spot for people representing multiple centuries who lived their lives in and around City Creek and the Jordan River. On May 3rd, 1987, the Block 49 Committee placed a marker on the site entitled Utah's First Burial Site on the corner of 3rd West and 3rd South. 
this is one of the field trips we have people go on as they read about the prior to the pioneers coming to Utah. The title has a double or confusing meaning, meaning this Utah first burial site. It's not only Mormon or Utah immigrants first burials, but in the archeological work that was completed around them, it was made clear that other humans had lived and loved and died in this valley. With this, I think it's appropriate now to indicate that, or to offer a land acknowledgement, that the lands described in Salt Lake City West Side Stories was and is the home of Utah's indigenous people, the Shoshone, the Ute, and others, whom in our quest for that promised valley, we nearly destroyed their society and we forced their removal from their lands. Fortunately, these prior inhabitants are still very much part of modern life in Utah. Another 30,000 foot observation that I sort of intuitively sensed that it was the lower ground of Salt Lake, but it became abundantly clear. With the city's gradual declining to City Creek and the Alluvian Fan and the Jordan River floodplain, both of which, prior to being channelized, meandered across the lower grasslands of the west side. This would have an adverse effect on street canals, collecting canals, sewage, and groundwater table. All of this had health consequences for the old west side. And I discuss in a couple of posts just how dangerous life was amongst the industry, but also being in the bottom of that um, at the bottom of that amphitheater that we call Salt Lake City. Today's Salt Lake City West Side neighborhoods west of the Jordan River have their demographics, their social makeup based on the Pioneer Park neighborhood. There is a diversity legacy in these neighborhoods. Today, people of color, contemporary immigrants and refugee communities live throughout Salt Lake Valley. However, the vast majority live west of the Pioneer Park neighborhood and I-15 in communities such as Poplar Grove, West Point, Rose Park, Glendale, Magnum, South Salt Lake, and West Valley City. This population of minorities and people of color is a legacy of the Pioneer Park neighborhood and that first west side. Since the arrival of the LDS European American settlers, nearly all communities of color <clears throat> up until the third quarter of the 20th century came to the park, to the Pioneer Park neighborhood. The fourth observation, Utah's modern post-industrial world we know and live in, in large part started with the railroads and the industry surrounding the Pioneer Park neighborhood. Utah loves their Pioneer period, 1847 to 1869, I do. And in a sense, it's Utah's creation story. A struggling religious community, forging a path into the wilderness, struggling for survival, and thereafter creating a near self-sustaining agricultural-based society, all within an implacable co cooperative ideals. It was the early Mormon pioneers who shaped the Intermountain West, making the desert bloom like a rose. However, it was Utah's gritty, industrial, capitalistic economy, its railroading, its mining, its commercial enterprises, late in the 19th century, that made statehood and Utah's modern world possible. Next 30,000 foot observation. Regarding the quest for statehood, statehood eventually came due to many reasons, some known and, none, and some not so well known. It was the rise of industrial and commercial enterprise with their insatiable demand for laborers, all those prior mentioned immigration groups that made statehood and Utah's modern world possible. The influx of non-Mormon immigrants, which reached in 1890, 44% of the population, along with the, success, the stopping of polygamy, or at least the attempt, and the LDS Churchman, Church's commitment to Republican Democratic government, which made statehood possible in 1896. You have likely heard the last two listed reasons, but have you heard the first one described, the demographics of the 1890s? Much of this centered in the Salt Lake's west side. The next 30,000 uh, 30, foot observation. 
Salt Lake City's earliest non-Mormon churches, synagogues, and schools all had their start in the streets between the two railroad stations and around the Pioneer Park. St. Mary's Academy, the Roman Catholic school, where they advertised in Butte, Montana, to send your girls to Salt Lake City for finishing. The First Baptist Church sat diagonal, or diagonally uh, behind, across from St. Mary's, and it faced the county courthouse. The First Presbyterian Church, which was a proselyting mission to the Mormons, was funded by Eastern benefactors. It had its start between First and Second South on Fourth West. In 1886, they adopted the name Westminster. Westminster College got its start in Old Salt Lake, west side of Salt Lake. Regarding the Jewish citizens, 23 families organized a synagogue in 1881 named B'nai Israel and built and opened its first temple on September 3rd, 1883 at 3rd West, and, or excuse me, 3rd South and 2nd West. Uh, by the way, there's a monument to that synagogue and it's in the wrong location because they didn't understand the street changes that occurred in 1970s on the west and north sides of Salt Lake. The Trinity African Methodist Episcopal, the AME Church, was established in 1891 on Fifth West and Sixth South, and the Calvary Baptist Church occupied a building that was previously located by the First Baptist Church. All of those early churches, with the exception of the Roman Catholic Church, had its start in the Pioneer Park neighborhood. Seventh observation, the beginning of modern corporate structure within the LDS church, its best teacher in the management of investments and holdings started with the construction and the grading of the Transcontinental Railroad in the late 1860s, then in accepting board positions and stock in Union Pacific in the early 70s, and the building of the Utah Central and Utah Southern Railroads and others all became an excellent educator in, in the LDS Church understanding what was then a very new modern American corporation. It also taught the church how to access financing in Eastern Urban Center, and also with the aid of Railroad Lobby, which was the largest political lobbyist group in America in the 19th century, they worked with the Republican Party in the 1890, and this was a key factor in Utah securing statehood. That all started with the railroad industry, which came from the West Side. Now there are within this series, some themes, themes that are like threads that run through the entire series. Homeland, first residence or starting point, as I mentioned earlier railroads and industry, contested space, long-standing relationship. What I realized is that there were foodstuffs and materials, Chinese, Japanese, Italian, that were sent across uh, the Intermountain West from Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City and the West Side was a regional hub and distribution center for thousands of other immigrants across the Western United States. Next transient, neighborhoods, identity and belonging, post-industrial history, which is of course more contemporary, and race. The idea of race permeates the West Side. Now for the rest of this presentation, I will speak only of a few of these themes. The first is homelands. This quote was taken from Jedediah Smith's journal dated June 22nd, 1827. Historian Dale Morgan first highlighted Smith's words about Salt Lake Valley. Those who may chance to read this at a distance, Smith wrote, from this scene may perhaps be surprised that the side of this lake, surrounded by a wilderness of over 2,000 mile diameter, excites, me, the, excites in me those feelings known to the traveler who, after long and perilous journeying, comes again in view of his home. By so it was with me, for I had traveled so much in the vicinity of Salt Lake that it had become my home in the wilderness. So many after Smith, so many people after Smith wrote this, even to the present, have expressed similar sentiments about this place. That is, that it is a homeland. 
Utah has always been a mix of sojourners, refugees, those passing through, many newcomers, newcomers, and those with deep multi-generational roots. This was the case anciently, was the case with Native American communities, and it is very much the case today with us. The new homeland for a beleaguered people. This is a drawing made by museum curator and historian Kurt Hendrickson. It's a bird's eye view of the fort that was built by the Latter-day Saints in July 1847. Amid the Jordan River low grasslands, the Mormon pioneers built something of an island. Their fort consisted of hundreds of cabins, an estimated 450 by 1848, and thousands of corralled livestock. It was surrounded by newly cleared, irrigated, and cultivated fields, 2,000 acres by 1848, by the spring of 1848. Later in history, many artists depicted the fort ordered and symmetrical, lacking lived-in wagons, scattered provisions, muddy roads, scrappy log and adobe cabins, adjacent cultivated fields radiating out from the fort, and numerous animal corrals all scattered about. What a scene it must have been, this grand gathering of religious refugees, which numbered 2,000 individuals by 1848. This was the homeland of the Mormons. <clears throat> the impact of the railroad was quite vast. On May 10th, 1869, the United States celebrated the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. But some time later, Utah had its own last bike ceremony. And this one was well attended by Brigham Young and hundreds of Latter-day Saints. The ceremony for the Utah Central Last Bike and the Utah Central Depot shared the same location on 4th West in between North and South Temple. This photograph is the Mormon Church's Last Bike Ceremony. The site it was intentionally constructed directly four blocks from Temple Square, Brigham Young's property and church headquarters. Built by the Mormon Church between March 1869, a month of incorporation, and the last bike ceremony on May 10th, 1870, the Utah Central Railroad linked Utah's capital city to the nation's first transcontinental railroad, and thus to markets in the Pacific, the Midwest, and the Eastern United States. The railroad brought church converts as well as merchandise, industrial goods, tourists, and many, uh, many other things but also made that goal of one monolithic, relatively isolated theocratic community of Latter-day Saints far more difficult to accomplish. Now this photograph is courtesy of Ron Fox who discovered it in the thousands of photographs at the Daughters of the Utah Pioneer Museum. To underscore the impact of the railroad and, the in, and what industry played in Utah and course in the west side. This is the Rio Grande Railroad map of January 1st, 1951, and it's courtesy of Don Strack in utahrails.net. Now to orient you to this map, uh, the map is oriented to the east. The top of the map starts at 2nd west, and the bottom is 9th west. This is a plan of all tracks, buildings, equipment, including the Union Pacific, Western Pacific, Bamberger, the Denver Rio Grande Western Railroad. Most importantly, it includes the names and locations of all the railroad connected factories, manufacturing plants, warehouses, refineries, feedlots, lumber yards, coal yards, scattered across the Pioneer neighborhood. Eventually, railroads and their supporting uh, buildings would cover 160 acres of the west side of Salt Lake City. And you can just carefully, every little uh, uh, property owner who has a, um, a wife or a spur is included in this map. So this has to do with railroads, which of course permeates the entire story of West Side Stories. The next has to do with contested space. This is the July 1897 dedication ceremony recorded 
uh, or for the uh, Pioneer Park, recorded by Salt Lake City photographer Charles Ellis Johnson. It is the dedication ceremony of the park by President Wilford Woodruff, and he is speaking uh, on a stand that has dozens of 1847 pioneers surrounding him. There was, in a certain sense, a making of Pioneer Park. 50 years after the Mormons arrived. The call for state and city and LDS church leaders before and after this 1897 dedication ceremony <clears throat> occurred when the West Side was experiencing a critical mass, a very public transformation from a predominantly Mormon neighborhood to a non-Mormon uh, neighborhood largely non-white, including African Americans, Italians, Greek Americans, Japanese Americans, and so many other migrants and immigrants. The Sons of the Utah Pioneers, 50 years later, uh, proposed an all-encompassing memorial, taking the entire park to tell the story not only of the United States depart departing Mormons, but now in mid 50, in the 1950s uh, America, they wanted to tell the Euro-American settlement story across the Intermountain West of law and order and process. The proposal included a statuary garden, a state history museum, and a reproduction of the Salt Lake City Theater. We could very well have had four reproductions of the theater had this been built. Now all of this, was to replace a park that was at that very time in constant use with social gatherings and as a playground for largely immigrant children. Those who used the park, the numerous communities that surrounded, surrounded it were predominantly minorities, people of color, non-Mormon and poor whites. Also by the mid 20th century, Salt Lake City's prevailing historical and social narratives changed from memorializing that Mormon city to the quintessential American white city. The efforts of memorializing the Pioneer Park or taking it back reflects these conflicting identities and differing priorities that existed in the West Side. To Salt Lake City's majority Mormon and white population, the park and neighborhood represented often a baffling combination of ethnicity and racial diversity constant poverty in a place of changing industrial uses, and it became a place of being uneasy and unfamiliar. I, I remember reading a couple of oral histories of, um, of, of a Greek family where they were instructed, never cross West Temple unless you're with an adult, <laughs> which I thought was very interesting because at the same time I was reading stories of people saying, never go to the west side of Salt Lake alone. Uh, the, um, excuse me, um, constant poverty in a place of changing industrial use, thus making it an uneasy place for many uh, majority whites in Salt Lake City. It was a place of others, and such it was eligible for urban renewal in the mid 20th century and a reclaiming of the Pioneer Park for its original story, at least for the Mormons' original story. In essence, Throughout most of its history, the park in this neighborhood has been a contested space, especially at efforts to memorialize the park. Now for the last little bit, I speak of so many different uh, communities, but I think I'll focus on the Jewish community in the West Side in this last few minutes, and I appreciate you bearing with me. Among all the different communities on the West Side that I wanted to profile, I thought of one tonight that I'd share. Note the small adobe house in the center of this photograph. And not the exact house that I want to speak about, but it's an appropriate comparison. It also shows the diversity of the building types found in the Pioneer Park neighborhood. Factories, apartment houses, homes, street signs, empty lots. Well-known 20th century Salt Lake City businessman, Irvine or Izzy Jerome Wagner, led a full and interesting life which started in the Pioneer Park neighborhood. His biographer and fellow Utah Westerner, Don Gale, explains that Wagner grew up on Third South, which was a busy industrial street. Wagner's father, Harry, 
had immigrated from Ukraine, while his mother, Rose Yudin, came from uh, Latvia. The Wagners lived in a small pioneer adobe house, just like the one in the center of this, bro of this photo, with an outhouse in the backyard and the family's only water source coming from a pump in the front yard. And this was in the 1920s. The home was located at 144 West and 3rd South. Where do you think that is today? The Rose Wagner Performing Arts Center. Now Izzy's father, Harry, started out as a trans in the transportation business, moving passengers, luggage, and freight from the West Side train depots to the city's hotels and boarding houses. And by the way, the West Side tells an interesting story. Uh, uh, you probably remember the Templeton Hotel and building across from Temple Square, and of course you know Hotel Utah, both of which were built as counter hotels to larger hotels that were built on the West Side and in the non-Mormon side of Main Street. So there was, in a sense, a hotel war going on. Uh, and it's played out between um, uh, now in some of the larger developments in Salt Lake City, between the heart of Salt Lake and the west side of Salt Lake. Very interesting that these hotel wars are 125 years old. Um, OK, excuse me. Wagner, this fellow who had this transportation business, he picked up miners, Italians, Greeks, and East Europeans from the railroad and brought them for a weekend, often picking them up for a weekend, seeking good times and a change of a chance to buy provisions. He often took his customers to small hotels on Second and Third South Street. At one time, the West Side had nearly a hundred two to three story hotels peppered across that neighborhood. Now, three of Izzy's childhood stories offer insights into the life of the West Side. Every week, Izzy's mother would visit a boarding house in Japantown, just two blocks to the north, and pay 25 cents for a tub of hot water to bathe herself and her children, while waiting at the top of the boarding house stairs for his turn in the copper tub. Wagner would listen to Japanese patrons speaking candidly and to one another below. Over time, the boarding house owner's son became one of Izzy Wagner's lifetime friends. His relationship with this young man demonstrates how people from different backgrounds forged enduring relationships in this very diverse West Side. Saying this, however, this did not happen all the time. Sadly, there's much of the research I conducted made very clear that there were racial pecking orders in the West Side. Now, immigrants from other nations often blended their cultural traditions with local customs. For instance, the Wagners spoke Yiddish and Hebrew at home, and the Wagners, uh, Izzy, and his siblings spoke English at school. Harry and Rose also spoke Russian and would use the language when they were talking about topics they did not want the children to understand. But during his childhood, Izzy delivered food and other orders from the Rexall drugstore on South Main Street to various prostitutes living near his third South home. One hotel that Izzy did this kind of business for was the Garden Hotel, which today is Squatter's Pub Brewery. Now, Izzy and his family brought their language and the rich cultural background to Salt Lake City's West Side. This is just one example of thousands of stories of a couple dozen ethnic groups that all lived in the west side of Salt Lake City. Now let me end there. Thank you. I hope what I presented tonight will encourage you to delve in a bit deeper into Salt Lake West Side stories. Thank you. Brad, that was wonderful. I, I assume uh, we're going to have some questions for our friend Brad Westwood. Yeah. I have just a quick comment. I remember, I think it was probably 15, 20 years, maybe 25 years ago, but I think it was right there on Second West. They were building apartments, condominiums, and they, the people that were constructing the contractor they discovered some pioneer graves right there on that spot. And I remember it delayed the 
the project for two months before, when they excavated yeah. all of those graves. Brad, do you remember hearing about that? Yeah, that, that is that Pioneer Cemetery. Yeah. And uh, they stopped the Palladian uh, apartment house for, uh, I think, uh, for about six months or longer. Yeah. And BYU's think... public archaeology did a magnificent job of pulling out some incredible artifacts and human remains. And um, it was sort of stunning because unbeknownst to the Mormon pioneers, just a foot or two below were all these ancient burials. I think it was actually a little longer than that. And there were loud complaints that it increased the cost of the contemporary uh, construction uh, significantly over that period. I, it might be was longer than six months. I, yeah. I probably am guessing wrong as I remember, Greg, but uh, it, it it, uh, it, it also uh, kind of prevented any archeological investigations thereafter because of its delay. Mm -hmm. There is a nice publication on that work from, I believe, the University of Utah. Yes, and it's included in my directed readings. And it's also digital and available online. Brad, Brad you know, the, um, wasn't, there, wasn't there a push to, to build a new ballpark? where Pioneer Park is. Didn't Dee Dee Cordini want to build a, yes. a new professional baseball park? And what kind of impact would have that had on this neighborhood? Well, uh, one thing I didn't mention is uh, it, it, the Pioneer vision, Brigham Young's vision was to have one central park and a park in each quadrant. <laughs> They're all gone. The only open space in urban Salt Lake City is the Pioneer Park. And so I think it would have been a travesty um, there was a, uh, there was a, a, a baseball diamond there, and in the first four parks of Salt Lake City, they had the first um, baseball, um, um, uh, urban baseball uh, uh, for kids uh, in these ah. parks. Brad, I've got a question for you. Can you can, hear me? I can, I, buddy. Um, as you know, I had my first store just down from the Historical Society on Rio Grande Street for six years. And <clears throat> right before I, we moved in, they found a, a dead body in the parking structure of my building. <laughs> and I thought, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> but um, I don't, if you, if you covered it, I, I had to leave for a second, I might have missed it. But when did that area really start to go into decline? and attract some of the problems that it had developed over years. It's a I mean, great, it was thriving at one time, and right? And it, what, it's a, it really is a great question, but the answer is forevermore. Because mm -hmm. at the very beginning of the railroads, they also had indigent people coming on the railroads. And then they had, you know, I didn't say this openly, but really the, predominant majority white population, either by law or, or uh, some way or another, created something of a ghetto for, for Salt Lake City. Mm. And it was because of the industry and the railroads and the, you know, otherwise not the best place to be. The Chinese had their uh, gardens there. They would come from Plum Alley to the west side to garden. Some even lived there. So from the very beginning, indigent life has been part of that area. And I hmm. tell the Pioneer Park Coalition, it's something in modern urban life they're gonna have to live with. It doesn't mean they can't reduce it considerably, but it's been there from the 1870s onward. Interesting. Well, thanks. I really enjoyed your presentation. How long, how long has this farmer's market been there? We've enjoyed going there uh, with family and I'm just curious, that's kind of helped the, the uh, overall looks or the overall atmosphere of the place. It has, uh, I believe it's now 25 years and it's a staple of West Side. <clears throat> I tracked all the other farmer markets. There were farmer markets uh, on Richard Street. There were farmer markets on North uh, Temple uh, there were a couple of locations uh, embedded in the west side, and so that too has been a tradition. 
with the exception of the Richard Street, uh, people from all over Salt Lake City would come to the west side uh, for their uh, open or for their produce. Great. Uh, and I'm really happy it's in the park now. It's, it's a wonderful addition. I had another question. It was about the uh, Greek Orthodox Church uh, nearby. What role has that played in the west side uh, history? Well, uh, I mentioned the, the uh, Baptists, uh, the Roman Catholic School, the African American churches. They all used it as a base camp, and then as they received more acceptance, they went elsewhere. The Greek Orthodox uh, Church and community has been committed there from 1903 to the present. Their first church was just uh, south of the Rio Grande Station. Uh, you could walk out of the Rio Grande Station, look right, and you would see the dome of the Greek Orthodox Church. And so my hat's off to the Greek community that has maintained a, a vibrant, uh, their annual, and, and that's something I tell people with, uh, with the Greek and Italian post in, in the West Side Stories. I tell people to go to the events, go to the, the Italian, annual Italian fair, as well as to the, the great Greek um, uh, uh, events that have been going on for now 50 years or longer. So it's a big part of the vibrancy of West Side. And all these new people, I mean, there's dozens of, over the last 20 years, there's been at least 15 major condominium developments. And so the, the pressure, the, the um, what, uh, what's the term? The uh, gentrification is slowly coming on. I mean, the Rio Grande project that tried to remove and control the homeless was really because of the outcry of millions and millions of dollars of development money that was going on in the West Side. So, um, but in any case, I, 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 I hope I, in that meandering, answered your question, friend. All right, I have a question. Uh, oh, I have a question. If I may. I'll take my turn. There's a, there's a monument at 447 uh, West, 4 South, to the first Greek church that was built yes. there in uh, yeah. 1905. Started. Was it? I said. Oh, I said three. I'm sorry. You know better, Mike. Well, no, it started in 03, but it probably ended up in 05. There's a wonderful photo in our archives that has the very first wedding at that church, and there must be 50 men in front of the church, and only one lady, and that lady was the bride, <laughs> <laughs> because. Uh, the, all the immigrants were coming from Greece and working here. They were very, they were, the women were very scarce. The current church uh, was built in 1923. Um, and then we're moving forward with a major, major old Greek town uh, museum, cultural center, uh, major complex with hotels and condos and, and commercial there where the Greek festival is held every year. We're fundraising for that. It's wonderful, Mike. I'm so glad to have you work with us on West Side Stories. That was really fascinating. I wish you could put all that in a, in a book to publish it because your material is so, so wonderful rather than just having it in a blog. I'd love to have a couple of those books, Brad. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. I appreciate that, Mike. Brad? Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, in the early pioneer period, the direction of settlement tended to be to the west and not to the east of, uh, of State Street. And, and the question I have maybe uh, has to do with George Q. Cannon. Years ago, uh, when I was dabbling in real estate, I found a home for sale on the west side that reportedly was belong belonged to George Q. Cannon. And uh, it was past the railroad tracks, and so I went and looked at it. And the house was pretty old and run down, of course, but the, the, the property and the land that was sitting on was very rich ag land, probably about three acres of old farmland with a barn and stuff. But I'm wondering if before the railroad, that's where most of the agricultural uh, uh, activity took place to, for Salt Lake. Well, I, I, I should correct or amend that slightly. The right. reason so much farming went on in the west side where it was cheap lots where immigrants could uh, rent. So the Chinese had their uh, gardens uh, uh, out there, not because the soil was all that great. In fact, it was the bottomlands 
of the Jordan River, most of the best farming, of course, was in the big fields south, you know, 21st South and that whole area there. Um, and, and of course, near the, the streams, you know, near the creeks, the seven creeks of Salt Lake. Okay. So Brad, I just wanted to ask a question that's related to that. Patty Sessions owned a lot and had a very large garden at the site where the Rio Grande Depot is. Uh. But she homesteaded on, you know, in the 40s, 1840s. So when do all those get cleared out? When the railroads come? I mean, she won prizes for her produce. And her well, I'll, so, I'll tell you, um, let me show you something. I'm going to drop back to my, <laughs> I, I had one other, a couple yeah, other photos it. I'd like to show maybe to answer your question. Um, so... The, um, let's see if I can get this. The, the first, uh, the 14th Ward uh, Relief Society Hall was the model for 130 uh, that were subsequently built that were women controlled uh, spaces. And um, there were a incredibly strong Mormon interaction this this building was only a block away from the railroad station and it was intentionally built there as a bulwark or a prevention or an effort to sell to uh, the local mormons and not have them beguiled by all the commerce that was coming in but the mormons continued to live in the west side it really isn't until about the turn of the century that that there is this massive population shift uh, their two wards were closed down in the neighborhood. Um, and, and you were talking about the Rio Grande Station. Not far from there was an adobe field where they got the adobe for the fort and for so many adobe cabins. Uh, but I'd love to look at that source. That fascinates me, Susan. Hey, yeah. hey Brad, I have, a, I have a question for you. So I'd forgotten this, but um, old family business, the Lambert Paper Company, which was my great grandfather's business. Their big warehouse building was on the south side of First South, where the Salt Palace is. It was torn down for the Salt Palace development. Whenever that was, the Salt, was the whole Salt Palace thing. Was that to try to upgrade the this neighborhood, or was it tried yeah. to, to 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 it obliterated to it? it obliterated two thirds of Japan Japan Town. It did, and and the Lambert Paper Company was right right by there, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, noodle, noodle restaurants, uh, uh, manufacturers. Um, I mean, there was a vibrant Japanese community, and we, and we're still destroying what little fragments are left of that community. Um, and it was all part of that mid-century concern about uh, redevelopment. Um, and the West Side was often seen as the best place for for development. Thus, we have the Salt Palace, the, the, um, uh, the, the you name it. There's six major block size developments that uh, came in these urban uh, uh, ethnic neighborhoods of Salt Lake. Brad, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to tell a little story. This is Ed Froughton. I don't, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ed. Uh, my first uh, foundry actually was on Second South. Most of you remember where Salt Lake Stamp Company was, the building. Just across the railroad tracks on the north side of the street, uh, just west of the tracks, was a, an old building owned by two Greeks who were mechanics. They worked on trucks. And I was looking for a location for a studio and a foundry, and I took I actually took in a partner on this building. But I went to see them, and they had uh, they had advertised the building for sale for some time, and it hadn't sold. And I got acquainted with them, and they said, "We want you to buy this building." And I said, "Well, why me?" And they said, "We love seeing what you do, and we're very proud of the arts and." And uh, so they gave me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I bought the building, moved in, and the partnership didn't work out very well. But I asked the two Greeks, I said, well, what do you plan to do? And they were aging, and one said, well, my brother wants a little money so he can go back to 
to Greece. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to go with him? And he said, no, I think I'm going to die first. <laughs> and sure enough, we completed the purchase of the building. Within a few months, he died. So that, that gave me an opportunity to get acquainted with the old Greek uh, temple and uh, attend that and find out you know, what was going on there. But I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't get to know more of the history. Well, of that when I, Ed, I, I want to add to what you said. When I was in the Salt Lake archives, the county archives, the land records, it, it, they're just rich with these Greek and Italian and Syrian and Japanese names. It, it's it's surprising how much life in Salt Lake City yeah. is now lost to us. Well, there are a lot of stories associated with that building that we were in, and uh, so someday when we have time, maybe we'll talk about a few of them. Brad, I, Brad, Brad, I'd like to know your opinion about something working with a coalition. Did you hear me? I can uh, hear you, buddy. You know, you, you, you talked about gentrification, and I'm, I'm a person who doesn't believe that gentrification is always a good thing. And, and you, you look at the, the, uh, as the history and the b background of the West Side, and it was a place where people could find affordable housing. You could buy a house, and, you know, it wasn't going to be the mansion on the hill. But as you gentrify an area, the people who are living there get run out. I think, and, I, and, and I'm wondering what the coalition, you know, everybody wants gentrification who are us snobby folks or whatever, because eyesore, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, hasn't it always provided something that a city needs, every city, a place where people can live? You know, I, I think I'd like to hear Susan Rue or someone else talk about that. I, I have to tell you, uh, as a historic preservationist and someone who's tried to understand how to preserve uh, culture without destroying it. Uh, you know, most of the time it's wealthy white Anglo-Saxon types that are destroying these neighborhoods. It's unfortunate yeah. but uh, capitalist, capitalist ways uh, prevail in Utah. And um, I, I don't know, I, I'm full of all kinds of ambiguity. I cannot tell you what the Pioneer Park Coalition's position is other than th they are really honing in on trying to assist the poor and homeless and trying to preserve the park. And I, my hat's off to them for that because uh, I didn't talk about this, but there's over a dozen efforts to put things in that park from railroad stations, uh, railroad yards, uh, to um, a, a pre-salt palace version was going to be built there, as well as uh, the Pioneer Park or the uh, the Sons of the Utah Pioneers Museum. So they just want to preserve the park. But I, I'm with you, Steve, on concerns about gentrification. Thank you. Great talk, Brad. That was fun. Yeah, fabulous talk. Mark, I just thank you. In, in thinking about um, the West Side, it's it's a hipster spot. I think they also wanted to be more of a hipster. You know, you go to the art galleries, they're down there on the west side. You know, the artist lofts are on the west side. It's kind of an antidote to the Romanized East Bench. And that's true in many cities down by the waterfront or the river or the railroads. That's why I'd really like to see that come together. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, there's some really fun still places, probably not cheap to buy, but there once was a time where artists and art space, the art space enterprise has developed four or five large properties, uh, the macaroni uh, factory. And um, so yeah, I, I, I really think that's been a vital part of the development, the pioneering, the urban pioneering of the West Side has been artists and, um, you know, people who, hipsters. Mm -hmm. Brad, could I ask you a, a, a question? Uh, when you talked about the changing of the, the streets back in the 1970s, for example, 9th West, you know, 8th West and so on, this is my, where my great grandfather was born and it's the home of David Love and Stephen H. Love was, was born in this home. 
And my great grandfather in his notes wrote that it was on 4th, South and 5th West. Hmm. It's an Adobe home and the family had a little grocery store and an Adobe brickyard in the back. Hmm. But would that then be, would it, would it be 4th, South and 6th West now? Am I understanding that yeah, correctly? It's... Tell me the address again. It, My great grandfather, in, in his life story, said it was on 4th South and 5th West, which would be right at the bottom of the viaduct, one half, one block to the west of Pioneer Park. So, but, so the, the way it used to work is you would have that's a by the way, it's a wonderful adobe home and complex. And I love the herb, the um the environmental portraiture with the family standing out there amongst the garden and so on. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so West Temple, first there was West Temple and then there was First, first West. West. And, and so um, that would probably be Fourth West now because when you include West Temple, everything has to shuffle. The reason they did that, of course, is because there were numbers that radiated from the meridian, but the streets were different. Um, so sure. I think, Doug, your your street is fourth west. So that would be Kitty Corner then to to Pioneer Park. It would, yeah. Because I I always assumed it was one block to the west, so it was just Kitty Corner to. Should, because my, my, you know that? my my grandfather's sister had a home, and from the old family lore is it was purchased by the Denver Rio Grande Railroad. And right where her home sat became their coal yard. Joe, the, the funkiest the funkiest part of the, the numbering in historic Salt Lake City was not because north was there was North Temple and then there was first north was 200 north. Same yep. going west, the south was the hardest mm -hmm. because first south, 100 south to ninth south were first south through ninth, 100 south to through ninth were first through ninth, but then the next one. 21st South was 12th. It was every yeah. major road after that. So it's, yeah, then it was every uh, section. It was it was oh, wow. 13th and 17th and 21st and, and 21st was at that point when my dad grew up next to 21st South was called 12th yeah. South. Yeah, there's oh, no wow. end to the confusion. It, it's yeah. just totally bizarre. <laughs> anyway, this Brad, this has been spectacular. We could go on all night, um, but we can't. And and please everybody give Brad a huge hand. This has been so fun. Thank you. Um, uh, and just totally appropriate for a special December uh, meeting, Brad. Thank you very much for everything. Um, and uh, we will. Oh, next month we're going to talk more about Salt Lake City, and I'm I uh, I'm going to be the one talking about it. I'm sorry. It's called Sounds A City fun. Divided, A City Divided, or Was It? Uh, living in Salt Lake City from the 1880s yeah. through the 1910s. And we'll talk about, uh, you know, the divisions and lack of divisions in Salt Lake City. Mostly it's a really good excuse to look at about 200 historic photographs of uh, Salt Lake City and its many guises during that period of time. So um, uh, join us uh, we'll, uh, uh, next next third Tuesday of next month and uh, have a wonderful and safe holiday. And I think that's it. Thank you, Ken. And thank you. Appreciate you all. Thanks. Happy thank holidays, you. everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Yeah. Merry Christmas. <laughs>